Welcome to Any Questions from the Radio Theatre at Broadcasting House in London. On our panel tonight, Jeremy Corbyn, the Islington North MP, who only just made it onto the Labour leadership ticket, but is now regarded as the front runner. Jeremy is standing on an anti-austerity platform, promising higher taxes for the rich and protection for people on welfare. And he says if elected leader, he'll formally apologise on behalf of the Labour Party for taking the country to war with Iraq. The Guardian columnist Polly Toynbee has had a long relationship with the Labour Party, both as a member and as a commentator. But Polly was also an early supporter of the Social Democrat Party. The SDP was a breakaway movement formed by Labour moderates in 1981 who were fearful that the party was being taken over by left-wing members. She later refused to support the merger of the SDP with the Liberals, which saw the formation of the Liberal Democrats, and instead she rejoined Labour. Elizabeth Truss is Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Liz has been the Conservative MP for South West Norfolk since 2010. She achieved swift promotion as a junior education minister, working alongside Michael Gove before entering the Cabinet in the reshuffle last summer. Her responsibilities at DEFRA include emergencies such as the flooding in Somerset last year, the common agricultural policy reform and biodiversity. She's also a qualified management accountant. Dan Jones is an historian and journalist. When asked in a recent interview what a historian was, Dan said, researcher, thinker, writer, storyteller, author, TV presenter, radio voice, lecturer, journalist, talking head, tweeter, truth teller, social conscience, archival curtain twitcher, licensed nose poker, some or all of the above, depending on the day of the week. His latest book, The Hollow Crown, is about the Wars of the Roses. That's our panel. So let's have our first question. Jill Jenkins, has this been Labour's summer of blood and will it lead to history repeating itself with the breakaway SDP? Jeremy Corbyn. The no. reference, oh, I must just point out, the reference, of course, is to Dan Jones's book, which was uh, a Summer of Blood and the, War, the Peasants' Revolt. The Peasants' Revolt, 1381. Oh. Absolutely not a summer of blood, quite the opposite. Uh, 600,000 people have now become members or supporters of the Labour Party, one of the largest ever democratic processes of any political party in Britain. We've had uh, 22 hustings meetings all over the country, and they've all been ram-packed uh, to overflowing. And I've spoken at uh, probably 40 other meetings since then. All of those have been overflowing as well. There's lots of young people joining Labour for the first time, lots of older people coming back, lots of people anxious to discuss why we lost the election, but discuss the future directions of the Labour Party. I think it's been an absolutely fascinating process. And to have overflow meetings in August on a political debate in a political party is something surely we should all be very pleased about. It's good for democracy and it's good for the Labour Party. And I've been absolutely enjoying the whole experience. And the meeting we had in Camden Town Hall was so much overflowing. We had uh, three overflow meetings, including one in the street. And there's a picture of three teenagers trying to climb into the meeting through a window. How good is that when young people try to climb through a window to join in a political debate? <laughs> Marvellous for you and the people who support you, but Yvette Cooper is among those, one of the other Labour leadership candidates, who suggested that perhaps the very fact of your perhaps becoming leader could cause a split in the party. Well, there's no reason for anybody to split at all. We're having a democratic process. We're having a debate. There will be an election of a leader and a deputy leader. And after that, there will no doubt be policy debates and policy discussions in which everybody can take part. But since the Labour Party's membership has grown so much, then surely that's something we can all be very pleased about. And why there has to be a split or a suggestion of a split, I really don't understand. We're an inclusive party and there's got to be space for everybody in it. How do you explain all the sort of Labour grandees, the figures from sort of Lord Kinnock, David Blunkett, who've come out perhaps to warn against you becoming the leader of the party? Well, I've heard that some people have said some unkind things. I'm sure, I'm sure they will, in the, due, in the fullness of time, recognise that uh, what my campaign is putting forward are a series of alternative policies, 
We have absolutely not and never will engage in personal abuse or the language of sniping. We stick resolutely to policies and political ideas. I think all of us need to understand that there is a thirst for real engagement in political discussion and debate out there, hence these huge number of people that are signing up to Labour and indeed attending all these events. And oh. So that means there's got to be a thirst for change as well, and I understand that some people are resenting this thirst for change. Well, I hope they'll see the error of their ways. Polly Toynbee, as I think I pointed out in the introduction, you've sort of been here before. Is there a danger of history repeating itself? Absolutely not going to be a split. Anybody who thought about it would be out of their mind. Our electoral system destroys. I've been there, I know. It destroys people who split away. I mean, you look at UKIP, they got 12 million votes, one MP. You look at the Greens... Four, a mil four, four million. Sorry, four, four million, million and one MP. But you look at the Greens who got one million uh, and one MP. Uh, we have a monstrous and corrupt electoral system that doesn't let people express their true feelings. Uh, the result of that is that uh, you have to have these large, baggy coalitions, two big parties holding, as it were, John Redwood and Kenneth Clark together somehow or another, uh, Jeremy Corbyn and, 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 and Liz Kendall and her supporters somehow or another. That is the only way that you can win an election. But how and do what... you explain Yvette <clears throat> Cooper talking about the possibility of the split and people like Chukra Munna and Tristram Hunt already working to set up this new party within the party, Labour for the Common Good? It'd be a terrible mistake and I hope they don't do it. I'm pretty certain that Jeremy Corbyn's going to win. It looks absolutely like an unstoppable surge. He has galvanised people on the left of politics in a quite extraordinary way. Everything is as is true. His meetings have been astounding, jam-packed with people, overflowing, a huge enthusiasm, bringing into Labour all sorts of people of the left who've been alienated in one way or another. All right, some of them, only 3,000 of them, have been weeded out because they're actually members and have stood against Labour, but that's not the story. The main story is exactly as he says, it seems to me almost certain that he's going to be the next leader, in which case Labour needs to get behind him and get united behind him. The, the question is, can he reach out, and can he reach out widely enough to people who are not naturally of the left, who didn't vote Labour or think of voting Labour or to the left last time? That's the great worry. Labour needs to win, you know, 100 seats from people and, and win, needs to win some Tory votes. My question for Jeremy is this. If it looks in a couple of years' time as if you were failing to do that, as if you are a drag on the party and holding it back and not actually galvanising all those people into, will you agree to stand down? Will you say, I tried? Gordon Brown should have done. Okay. Uh, Ed Miliband should Jer have done. Jeremy, Jeremy would, you, would you stand down? It's a very strange question. We haven't even been elected yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> There is and should be democratic accountability within the party. There is a procedure that an election can be triggered on an annual basis if people really want to do that. Therefore, that is open to them. But I think we should, as you quite rightly say, recognise this process that's going on and get stuck in with opposing what this government is doing. But I think we have to have a much clearer alternative than that which was, we presented in May. And that is the whole point of the campaign that uh, we've been running for the past one other, uh, eight weeks. One other quick point, that if I can pick very, up on... Let me just say this. <coughs> that would be very divisive if you wait for somebody to unseat you. Gordon Brown should have stood down elegantly, so should Ed Miliband, when it was clear that they were running as a drag on their party. They were holding the party back. The elegant and, and honourable thing to do would be to stand down if you fail. And that's what I want to know from you. Well, would Polly you say, would... I'll stand aside yeah. if it seems oh. that I'm not helping to remove the Conservatives from power? We're crossing an awful lot of bridges which we haven't even reached yet. Um, can I just repeat well, what I said? OK, well, one quick no. question. I'd like to move on. One quick question then. Picking up another point that Polly Toyn be made, uh, she talks about the party uniting behind you if you win. You've rebelled, I think, 500 times. How can you ask for party loyalty with that record? Well, I have voted against the war in Iraq. I voted against what I believe to be anti-terror legislation which was damaging to our civil liberties. 
student fees and other things that I thought were fundamentally mistaken and wrong. I absolutely supported the introduction of the National Minimum Wage, Sure Start, Children's Centres, Equalities Legislation, Disability Discrimination Act, Human Rights Act, you name it, there's lots of things I've supported. Okay. Um, and so I've played my part in that. Does it mean that the Parliamentary Labour Party has to be a complete monolith? No, it does not, because all MPs have brains, all MPs, I hope, have consciences, and all MPs ought to have a right to exercise those consciences. That is what makes for a strong democracy. But I also think that there has to be space for debate within the parties, and one of my resentments is the way in which the Parliamentary Labour Party has conducted itself during all the time I've been in Parliament is there's actually very little space for genuine debate within the PLP. I hope there will be plenty of space okay. for debate within the Parliamentary Labour Party but after this election. Liz Truss, you're watching all this from the outside, from the government benches. What does it look like to you, a summer of blood? Well, what I would say is that I briefly served on the Justice Select Committee uh, with Jeremy before he was famous. Uh, and uh, you know, what, I, what I know of him and at that time, you know, he's a principled politician who believes in ideas. Now, there are very few of those ideas I agree with. For example, things like leaving NATO. I think he made some good comments about gardening uh, last week, which I, I had some sympathy with. But what I think Jeremy's rise illustrates is just the vacuum of ideas in the Labour Party. And I really saw that over the course of the last Parliament, is that the momentum and the new ideas were coming from the Conservatives. We were talking about ways to move the country forward, what we could do, and there was a real lack of debate from Labour. And I think what we're seeing is the weakness in the Labour field and a lack of proper discussion. And I think you know, discussion is good for politics. I didn't agree with Jeremy's ideas, but he is putting those ideas forward. And we need to be talking about, as a country, how do we deal with the challenges of the future? How do we deal with globalisation? How do we make sure that every citizen in this country can get on if they work hard? Those are the questions we need to be addressing. And I do think... The Labour leadership debate has opened up the fact that there haven't been those ideas coming from that side of politics. Okay. Dan Jones, it was your book that was uh, referenced in the question. Well, I think everyone's missing one very important issue, which is the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. Um, and uh, <laughs> people have said unkind things about Jeremy, um, and I promise this isn't an unkind thing. When I, when I see in Jeremy something of the John Ball, the rabble-rouser, the radical preacher, the serial rebel who's risen as it were, uh, unnoticed until it's too late. These, the, this real, when Adam delved and Eve span, who then was the gentleman, you know, idealism, uh, or, or where then was David Miliband, if you want to rhyme it that way. Um, <laughs> I suspect, and again, I don't mean this unkindly, I suspect that the Parliamentary Labour Party, if Jeremy is elected, will, will make this uh, a rather short-lived summer of blood. However, I think um, the Labour Party has the luxury in, op in opposition, which they might not think is a luxury, of the fixed-term Parliament Act, which means they can afford, as it were, a gap year, uh, a time to do exactly what uh, Jeremy is here to do, which is to have this out, to thrash out the issues. The reason that Jeremy Corbyn is a candidate uh, for leadership of the Labour Party is precisely so we can all sit in this hall and have these discussions, because the idea I think for Labour uh, members, of which I'm, I'm not one, the idea of going through another four or five years with the same bland platitudes and the attempt to draw dividing lines between Labour and the Conservatives, which barely really exist, is just so disheartening. And if I were a Labour member, um, I would vote one, two and three for Jeremy, not because I necessarily think he will be the next Prime Minister, but because he's a mischief maker, and as a historian, uh, I, I approve of mischief makers. Um, <laughs> very much. On to our next question, please. Uh, Ross Tanner. Given the calls from other European nations for the UK to accept a share of migrants entering Europe, what would be the fair share for the UK to accept? Liz Truss. Well, we do face very, very serious issues, as I alluded to in my previous answer, that we are seeing migrants for a variety of reasons, many asylum seekers because of the very, very difficult international situation with uh, the rise of ISIL, uh, for example, but also economic migrants who are seeking a better life. And the fact is that technology means that people are now able to see uh, what others have around the world. We also have some very 
evil gangs of traffickers who are prepared to uh, damage damage people in in an effort to make money. So there is not one simple solution to this overall problem. Yes, we do uh, need to play our part in homing asylum seekers in a way that's fair to the British people and also to legitimate migrants. But we also need to deal with these problems at source, and that's what our international development is, budget is about. So, for example, we're the second largest uh, donor to Syria uh, in, he- in helping build things there. And we need to make sure that we are dealing with the trafficking gangs. But the question, asks, why... the question asks is about the number of migrants and what yep. the share that the UK should accept. Germany this week said that mm-hmm. it expected to accept 800,000 people. That's almost as many people as live in the city of Leeds. What would be a fair share for the UK to accept? Well, well, my point is it's not just about a fair share. It's also about trying to deal with the issues at source. So we would reduce the numbers of people who are migrating. Because, you know, we do have a pledge to keep our immigration system to tens of thousands. That's important. It's an important ambition. And we, w- we need to be the fair to the people who live in this country as well as fair to asylum seekers. So we have a process for that. I can't give you a number uh, today, but what I'm saying is it's a complex situation that requires a variety of solutions, not just sharing out a pie. Jeremy Corbyn. Well, there's the biggest global crisis ever of displaced people all, all around the world. And it um, is an issue that, frankly, all nations have got to address much better. And the UN has got to address much more vigorously than it's been able to at the present time. I mean, look at the numbers that are fleeing from Syria into Lebanon, the numbers that have fled from Iraq previously into Syria, and so it goes on. And those desperate people in Libya trying to get across the Mediterranean and those that finally make it to Europe as opposed to those thousands that have died. Um, There isn't a military solution to this problem. There isn't an electric fence solution to this problem. There has to be a human solution to this problem. And that means, yes, giving more support. We give a lot already, but more support to the refugee camps in Lebanon and particularly in Libya. It also means addressing the human rights crisis that exists in many parts of the Horn of Africa, particularly Somalia and Eritrea, but it also means having a human approach to those people that are in Calais. Germany, as the questioner quite rightly points out, um, accepts far more refugees than any other European country. In fact, it accepts more than the rest of Europe put together. So should the UK uh, so do So I think more? we should be playing our part and taking a share of those people so that they can gain a place of asylum and safety in Britain and also recognise that people that have sought and gained asylum in Britain have made a fantastic contribution to our society, but, but let worked me give incredibly you another hard number. and improved our, our society. Let me give you another number. The European Union's Border Control Agency, Frontex, suggests that it's detected 107,500 people arriving into the EU outside regular channels in July, which is much higher than last year. In, in June, it was 70,000. So how many of those people should be allowed into the UK? Look at it another way. Are we going to put more and more forces on the borders of Greece? And the events that happened today between Greece and Macedonia are quite frightening. Are we actually going to see sort of armed guards all around Europe keeping out the poor and the desperate, some of whom are victims of impoverishment, which is a product of a whole lot of economic circumstances. Some are victims of wars that we have been involved with, such as Iraq and the bombing of Libya. And there has to be a much better, much bigger, much stronger global response to deal with the issue of instability and desperation of people all around the world. So are you suggesting that you'd allow more people in then? We ha- Europe as a whole has to be prepared to accept more people, but Europe as a whole, as the United States and other wealthy countries in the world have got to be prepared to do, is far more to deal with the issue. At the end of the Second World War, there was a coming together of um, all of the wealthy nations to accept very large numbers of refugees because they saw that as a humanitarian crisis. Is it different because so many of these people come from Africa as opposed to come from Europe? Dan Jones. I I can quite understand not wanting to put a number on it, partly because this is a a crisis of almost um, unimaginable, unprecedented um, scale, as Jeremy points out, partly because putting a number on it is a hostage to fortune. Um, What I I would say is that the compassionate thing that we can do as, as, you know, civilised Europeans um, 
uh, or people who consider ourselves civilized, is to take as many people as we can afford. Uh, and some of these people are fleeing Syria, Libya, places where crucifixion, rape, beheading, government disappearing people, as happens in, in Eritrea, is going on. Um, and we have the, the uh, image of James Brokenshire going around the Calais migrant camp this week, telling people that in the UK it's not a land of milk and honey. And I, I sort of struggle to think what he's telling people the UK must be like. Um, the fifth test isn't going so well at the Oval, or the tube drivers are on strike, or Jeremy's about to be elected Labour Party leader. I mean, this is just so fatuous. This is, as Jeremy rightly says, a, a crisis of um, unprecedented global scale. And we have a moral duty to take as many migrants from these, these tortured places as we can afford. Holly Toynbee. I agree. I think it's astonishing that the rest of Europe has been so tolerant of us. We make such a fuss about 3,000 people in Calais that we're trying to keep out. That's 1% of the people uh, on the move. You look at Greece absolutely on its knees uh, with huge numbers of people arriving. Uh, and Italy, too, also not, not as well off as we are, uh, arriving in, in large numbers. And we simply put up the barricades, send the French more fences... I, mean, I think it's interesting to think about what would happen if we left Europe. What would they all do, the French, the Belgians, the Dutch? Wouldn't they all just put them in boats and send them off to us? I mean, why would they act as our border police? I think it's, you know, when people say, well, we want to leave Europe because of migration, they ought to think very hard about what the rest of Europe would do to us. I find it quite amazing that the French are as patient as we are. Imagine if we had camps like those appalling shanty towns in, say, Bournemouth or Worthing on our beaches. We wouldn't tolerate it. We would, uh, they are much more tolerant than us. We keep talking about what a tolerant country we are. I think through this crisis, we should hang our heads in shame compared with the rest of Europe, especially Germany and Sweden. Just one quick follow-up, though. You mentioned four million people voted for UKIP at the last election. There is a substantial section of the electorate that feels very, very worried about this. Politically, yep. is it tenable to talk about allowing many more people it's in? It's very difficult. In fact, today there's been an Ipsos Mori poll that shows that immigration is right up at the top again of people's concerns. There well, hasn't been much else happening, perhaps, in, except Jeremy Corbyn uh, in August. And so there has been a lot of attention on what's happened in Calais, which was combined with the, the strike in Calais that made the situation worse for holidaymakers. Um, I think that it is the duty of governments sometimes to say... We have a moral obligation, we have to do this, and to give leadership and not to simply cravenly follow people's fears. Our next question, please. Andy Parnas, do you think it is fair that tube drivers get paid twice as much as nurses? And if not, how do you propose we change it? Dan Jones, does it matter what people are paid? Um, it does matter very much what people are paid, and I think uh, that there is an extraordinary um, lack of sympathy in London towards the tube drivers. Uh, whether that's, that's right or wrong, I suspect there are a lot of people who think it's right. But um, I should just point out there's a tube strike scheduled for the coming week and also the, rail strikes there, by there, First Great there Western. Is, there are two tube strikes, I think, scheduled mm. for next week in the lead-up to the bank holiday. And uh, I'm afraid that the tube uh, drivers and, and their unions have handled this extremely badly. And... Uh, if, if you want to sort this out, you know, you need the population of London not to be schlepping about walking an hour or an hour and a half because they're on strike. I think there's no sympathy for the tube drivers in this, and I think it's absolutely, um, absolutely not right that tube drivers are paid twice as much as nurses. I've absolutely no idea how to fix it either, but um, maybe um, we can print some money. Over to you, Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn. Well, uh, maybe nurses should be paid a bit more and not have their salaries frozen by the government. <clears throat> Tube drivers and all workers on um, London Underground do a very responsible job and ensure that up to four million people a day are able to travel safely. Transport for London has decided it wants to bring in the 24-hour tube in September. 
There have been lengthy negotiations with the unions representing the, all the tube workers on this. There is still some distance between them on this. And I find it quite bizarre that the Mayor of London has uh, resolutely refused to meet the representatives of the workforce that deliver the tube service for him day in, day out. And um, it may well be an agreement will be reached and the strikes don't go ahead. I, I don't know. I'm not party to the negotiations. But I do think we should, if, we think, if we're moving on to 24-hour working of any service, think very carefully about the uh, treatment of staff in that respect, the work-life balance they have, because you can understand concerns. If you're starting it on two or three lines, it will probably extend later to many more lines. And if you don't get the principle right at the beginning and get agreement at the beginning, then there's problems further down the line. So perhaps a message ought to be that Boris Johnson, I don't know where he is at the moment, take a day or two off and actually get involved in the negotiations rather than shouting from the sidelines. <laughs> Polly Toynbee, is it helpful to make comparisons like this? A driver's starting salary is just below £50,000 after six months of training. A nurse starting is, is starting salary is at about £21,000. Yes, I think it's very important to make comparisons. I think, uh, I think it matters a lot. I think the dysfunctions in our pay structure is so appalling that you can have FTSE chief executives earning you know, 150 times what, their, what the average, not the lowest paid, uh, of their staff earning. And their pay goes on and on up absolutely because there is no cap, there is no let or hindrance on what they should pay themselves. Where unions are strong, pay is held up. The bottom two-thirds of people in this country have seen very, very little rise in their pay for a decade from before the, before the crash, except where unions are strong. Ever since unions have declined, we have seen pay shoot up at the top and be pegged down at the bottom. Now, you're going to get dysfunctions all the way through. So happens that two stripers are a small group who are rather easy to organise, who've got a powerful union, and they can hang on to their pay. Well, good for them, frankly. Uh, they're not the same as uh, they're not exactly paid the same as as, as chief executives or board members of FTSE companies. Uh, nurses, of course, should be paid more. It's quite disgraceful that public sector workers' pay has been held down for year after year after year and for the next five years. Uh, we depend on them absolutely. We rely on them. We admire them. We should pay them properly. Liz Truss. Well, first of all, I think you know, we depend on the tube to get to work. You know, a lot of people earning less than tube drivers need to do that. Instead, they're having to walk or find other methods of getting to work, sometimes at very antisocial hours. I think that's something that tube drivers should take into account. I also think there's an interesting comparison with what bus drivers uh, are paid as well as other as well as other workers in the public sector of course we do face a huge budget deficit and we have had to make difficult decisions and you know I realize this as a government minister you know, likewise with the civil service but it's important that we live within our means as a country so we are able to see the economic growth we are able to see and we are starting to see wages increase uh, now and we've managed to see employment uh, increase as well because people being in work is vitally important to their own security and to our country's economy and prosperity and we simply couldn't go on spending more and more money borrowing more and more money and not being able to pay it back so we have had to make difficult decisions I do think though it's wrong for tube drivers to be holding people to ransom which is essentially what's happening we need we need to be able to have public services that are modernised, that can operate 24 hours. You know, we, we operate in a very, very competitive world. And we need to... And one of my concerns about the debate that's going on in politics at the moment is it's insular. We need to compete with not just other countries in Europe, but America, Asia, and we need to look outside. And sometimes it can feel like it's, you know, we're gazing at our own navels. Andy Parnas, you asked the question, what's your view? Um, yeah, I mean, it's all, all very interesting. I guess, I guess following it to its logical conclusion, if, if we're going to sort of side with the tube drivers, um, give, given the, one of the reasons they're paid so well is obviously because the union's so strong, should therefore all the other workers, nurses and, and other sort of teachers, therefore try and 
set up stronger unions so, so they all get paid more. Liz Truss, implicit in, in the question and in a sense the, the conversation about the unions is this idea that perhaps we value tube drivers much more highly than we value nurses. Well, I don't, I don't think that's true at all. I think you know, what we are doing as a government is we're introducing the living wage to make sure that everybody uh, is paid at a decent, at a decent level it's not at a, the same not a, time not as reforming wage. welfare and taking people out of taxation, which will bring more money into the pockets of low earners and their families and also well, help get more people into work which is really important. Well, isn't I don't think it's right pay? that the government should go around setting the salaries of everybody in the country and start setting the rates at which private companies pay people. I do think there's a role for shareholders to make sure that chief executives are being but paid at a reasonable level. But Elizabeth, the health workers are actually ultimately employed by the government. The government has a complete role in that. So why is it they've held NHS pay down for so long? Why are nurses so badly paid? This is the one well, area the government can actually very easily do something about it. It's chosen not to. I mean, I know that you didn't support all of the <clears throat> policies of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, but the fact is, in 2010, we inherited a very, very high level of deficit. We'd seen a ballooning... We've seen a ballooning in spending. We've seen a very high level of public debt. And did nurses and the cause fact that is, crisis? The fact oh. is... Well, I would argue that um, excess spending by the previous government, which none of the people in the Labour Party leadership election seem to agree, contributed to the position we're in now. Look, you're and an economist. You know take, perfectly well that's just we not do, true. We do... We've just had a general election. I don't think the people of Britain agree with you. Tim Hillier, is the retail price of milk too low? Liz Truss, this is a, a bit of a, a crisis for farmers. We know they've been very unhappy about the price of milk. Is the retail price of milk too low? Well, we have, we have seen uh, moves over the past few weeks of supermarkets to increase uh, the price of milk they're paying with, to farmers. And indeed, some supermarkets are now having a special brand of farmer's milk. What I would say, though, is actually the price of milk that farmers are receiving for liquid milk is higher than what they're receiving for cheese, yoghurt and butter. And the real issue we face is that we have a 1.3 billion dairy deficit. We're actually importing most of our yoghurt. We're importing most of our cheese and we're importing most of our butter. So one of the things I want the supermarkets to look at is how can they better communicate with consumers about what they're buying. There was some welcome news today that Tesco is now saying it's going to source its yoghurt from the UK. But really, it's the prices of those products, and that's also where the opportunities are to export more of our dairy products, I think, that are the issue we should focus on. Dan Jones, this is one of those trick questions that sometimes put to politicians. What's the price of a pint of milk? Is the price, whatever it is, too low? 39p, I think. Um, I, I enjoy the fact we're here to discuss the price of milk. Um, my understanding, and I am, I am an amateur in, in, in the field of milk, so if there are any, any experts, please, um, please moo. Um, <laughs> my understanding of this is that the quota was taken away on the 1st of April in order to encourage the dairy industry to become more efficient uh, and as they're doing, as the head of the dairy industry in Germany has said they're going to do, to concentrate on exports to, to become a modern industry. Now, I do have some sympathy, having grown up in, in the countryside, with, uh, with the sort of idea that we'd like our dairy industry to remain kind of pastoral and romantic and there to be cows in the field when we all jolly off down to the Cotswolds for the weekend. I'm sure all of us, except for, uh, except for Jeremy, do. Um, I'm, I'm not picking on Jeremy, I promise. Uh, look, but look... Uh, there are good sentimental and aesthetic reasons for us supporting the dairy industry, but it has to operate on its own. I'd like to sort of widen the, the food uh, or, or beverage question out a little bit, if I may, which is to say, if we want to be really radical about supporting our dairy industry via the government, then here's what we'd do. I think uh, we would uh, take the Jamie Oliver line of putting an immediate and punitive tax on sugary drinks 
you know, milk being quite a healthy drink, good for your kids, good for your teeth. If you slap it immediately on Red Bull and Pepsi and Coca Cola and all those other brands, I'm not supposed to say on the BBC. I was about to say other perhaps, brands are perhaps available. Other, other brands are available. They're bad for you too. Um, <laughs> levy it. Levy it at the rate that uh, tax is levied on on beer, at 44 pence per pint. That uh, that is slightly more than a, uh, the pint, the price of a pint of milk and place all of that money into a nice fund that we can use to, uh, to help our dairy industry. I think that would be uh, welcomed by the Department of Education, who would find children weren't drinking fizzy drinks in school. I think it would be welcomed by the Department of Health. Um, but, but Liz, I'm sure, is, is closer well, to the Let's ask Liz, it, there's a solution for you. Well, it's a, it, it's a very interesting idea. That, uh, <laughs> and and, and I, do think, I do think there are opportunities for us to look more widely at food. It's a, it's a massive industry for our country. It's worth £100 billion. 75% of our country is covered in farmland. So actually, it's really important for our environment as well. And I think there is more we can do to link up those things. And I'm working on, I'm working on plans for that for the moment. But I do think you know, we are facing a specific issue on global milk prices. There's been massive production across the world. And farmers are suffering at the moment. So we are doing what we can in terms of cash flow, in terms of things like delaying tax payments for farmers, enabling them to average those over a period of years to help them manage in that global market. But you're absolutely right. There is a, there is a global market for milk, and what we need to do is help our farmers well, compete. And, and seriously, this yeah. is for the dairy industry to get, to get a grip, isn't it? I mean, this is for the dairy industry to, to become a modern industry. And, and that, that unfortunately means um, that uh, it becomes... Um, large scale, it becomes industrialised, it becomes probably cows being... being I, uh, I don't, I don't think that's always true, actually. I think there is space for large dairy companies, but also we're seeing a massive increase in craft cheese production. So we've now got 700 varieties of cheese here in the UK, which is more than France. It's immensely popular. People want to know where their food comes from. They want to understand well, so, so, that it's... On, they on, want to someone, be able to people, see people, the farm. Bougie people like us want, to know, where, want to know where their food comes from. Most people in this country want their food to be cheap. And we have people taking food from food banks in this country. And the idea that we do anything to, to raise the price of milk is, uh, would strike a lot of people as, as very... very Jeremy certain. Corbyn. Yeah, but the, this free market uh, approach to the dairy industry is, means that lots of dairy farmers are now going out of business. Those that remain either try and survive on cheese production or whatever else, and you're right, there are 700 varieties of cheese in Britain, which is great, more than France. Um, but the whole issue is that if the supermarkets are allowed to continue with their aggressive practices towards the dairy industry, more and more will go out of business. There'll be less dairy production in Britain. We'll actually end up importing more and more milk. Now, we lost the milk marketing board a long time ago. Now, I grew up in a dairy farming area, and I remember farmers always complaining about the milk marketing board. These days, they'd love to have it back because they knew they were going to get some income every month from the milk check. And so... We now have this direct buying by the supermarkets and the aggression that goes with it. We have an ineffective grocery adjudicator, which isn't doing very much to uh, control the prices. Isn't there a case for the government to intervene in some way to protect the dairy industry rather than leave it to the conscience of consumers to buy farmer's milk or the other bit of milk, uh, which is what you, is happening now in Morrison's would, and would Tesco's? You, one of our questions, actually, which we didn't have room for, was suggesting that perhaps you might consider nationalising it? Is that something you would No, advocate? I wouldn't uh, consider nationalising the dairy industry. What I would consider is looking at the issue of the generality of farming in Britain, the way in which small farmers are often squeezed by the big buyers, and the way in which the um, mega farms are being introduced in the dairy industry, with all kinds of concerns about animal welfare that go with it. And that is, again, a product of this aggressive free market approach to agriculture, whereas ever since the Second World War, we've had a basically a supported agricultural industry in okay. Britain. This trust briefly. I just thought, I mean, I don't know what Jeremy's views are on the European Union, whether he wants to stay a member of it or not. But the, the fact is that the price setting mechanisms and the intervention price are set at a European Union level. Yeah. So it's not it's not simply a matter for the UK. So what are we doing in the part... European Union to ensure there is an efficient price structure? Well, what I want to see is I want to see a proper futures market develop in milk so that farmers are able to manage their businesses in a forward-looking way. I think we've already got that in the arable sector where it's been successful in helping arable farmers manage. And I want the same kind of mechanism in the dairy sector to help manage. And I think if you look at some of our... Uh, European competitors, 
they have been successful exporting products on that basis, and that's the way we need to go. Polly Toynbee. Well, um, I think just about all I know about dairy farming, I've learnt from uh, David and Ruth on the arches. Um, <laughs> mind you, that's quite a lot. If you follow it, you really, really get to know about it. I find it quite interesting, I think I disagree with Jeremy here, that when it comes to a government that absolutely has let the market rip in all directions, the moment it's farmers, you get much jumpier. Uh, farmers get, on the whole, privile privileged treatment. You're talking about, you know, allowing them to delay their taxes. Who else gets to delay their taxes? Um, I think that Quite a few farming is very actually, close. Polly. Is on the whole very close to the Conservative Party and Conservative interests, and the farming areas are nearly all Conservative areas. And um, big, big farms, <clears throat> big farms are well, and some of the small ones too. And um, I think that you know, you you on the whole look out for their interests. We do need cheap milk. But we also need uh, lots of nice countryside too, and we know that cows keep the countryside nice. It's a difficult balance. I think you need both cheap milk on the one hand, those of us who okay. can afford to pay more should buy British milk. Leslie Marshall, is it reasonable to compare what IS have done and are doing in Iraq and Syria with the actions of the US military in Fallujah? Jeremy Corbyn, I think this refers back to remarks that you were said to have made at some point in the past. What IS is doing is appalling and disgraceful, an appalling organization and executions, beheadings and all the rest that it does is absolutely wrong. Uh, all that I pointed out some time ago in an interview that there were not clean hands all over the world on these issues and what the US did in Fallujah when they went in there and the bombardment of it and the treatment of its people was also appalling. To say they're an equivalence is not, is not the point. The point is that if you're going to condemn ISIS, as we must and we should, then you've also got to be prepared to uh, criticise yourselves when you do things that are, are so appalling as what the US did in Fallujah. <laughs> Polly Toynbee. Well, I think there's been a great smear campaign against Jeremy. I don't think he's for one minute anti-Semitic or racist or any of the other things that they have accused him of. But I do think that in the course of the alliances that he's made, that he has had a certain sort of tolerance for tyrants and, di and dictators on the grounds that of my enemy's enemy, that if you start out you know, being profoundly anti-American and thinking the Americans are the root of most evil, you will end up sitting with some pretty unsavorable people along the way, including being a little bit soft on Putin and others. And I think that's a danger. But I do think... Well, there's been Well, there's been, a, you know, there's been well, an when? element... Of, well, appearing on Russian television and well, that I've been on Russian thing. television. Yes. I've also been on American television, well, and so have you. So, so what's the problem? I think, uh, I think, on the whole, this is mostly unfair about you. But on the other hand, I think it's something you have to watch out for, that there is uh, a temptation to always think that anybody who's being anti-American must somehow have some right on their side. Sometimes both sides can be absolutely wrong. Liz Truss. Well, I certainly don't agree with the idea that ISIL and the US are morally equivalent, and I think it's very dangerous... Uh, that we are potentially putting, well, that was the question, putting those, those messages out there. I'm also very worried about the idea that we should withdraw from NATO. I think NATO has been a force for stability. Uh, it's very important uh, in terms of our defence of our country. And we should be very worried about having a foreign policy that moves away from the stability uh, the, that we've achieved and the ability to deal with some of these real threats we face from organisations like ISIL who are carrying out sickening uh, attacks and behaviour. And I think when we start going down this road of the idea that everybody's morally equivalent or some people are, you know, they're all in the same boat, I think that is very, very damaging. Dan Jones. I think um, the eyes of historians um, have been particularly on events... Um, events in Syria, events in Iraq this week, with the beheading and desecration of uh, Khalid al-Assad in al-Palmyra, his body hanged up um, crucifixion style in the street, uh, merely for trying to protect historical relics. Um, I mean, words almost fail you with how barbaric that is. Um, uh, but I think... <laughs> I mean, it is, it is. It's, 
it's, it's, it's as foul as, as anything's happened. But, but then I still do foul and barbaric things to people every day. I don't think uh, the US um, ever did anything quite like that. But what I would say about this is um, that I think Jeremy's uh, comments about ISIL and, and America, which I think were made to Russia today, uh, have so clearly been taken out of context. There may have been an element of, of playing to the gallery, possibly, given that you were doing an interview with a Russian television station, but everyone knows who reads that sentence exactly what Jeremy means. Okay, and Jer nobody is stupid enough to think that Jer Jeremy Corbyn we're, is an ISIL supporter. This almost, is the reason why people we're support We're almost Jeremy. out of time, but Jeremy Corbyn, these associations, as Polly Toynbee puts it, have you come under much more scrutiny than you ever expected and has proven to be rather difficult, having side, been on platforms of people that perhaps many others would object to. Well, <clears throat> yes, you have to, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to talk to people with whom you profoundly disagree if you're to make any progress. And hence, we are all now very proud of the peace process in Northern Ireland. Indeed, we see it as a great British export around the world. But people who had maintained contact with Sinn Féin in the 1980s, like I did, were routinely condemned for so, so doing. There is very difficult negotiations going on in Colombia, making progress, partly on the same kind okay. of model. Yes, I've met people in Israel and Palestine with whom I profoundly disagree. But at some point, there has to be a negotiated peace process. Otherwise, you're never going to make any progress. Okay. Does, if Je you only talk to people you agree with, you're not getting very far. Jeremy Corbyn, thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you to all our panel this evening. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn, Dan Jones, Polly Toynbee and Elizabeth Truss. Thank you all very much.